Thank you for tuning in to the Biz Nation podcast. My name is Kerry Zarb and I've been helping business owners just like you go from headache to heaven in a heartbeat for over 20 years. I'll be giving you all the top advice for getting started in your business, but I'll also be speaking with some of the best business minds to inspire you with valuable insights to help you get ahead in your business. If you've ever hit a roadblock or lost your passion, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the Biz Nation podcast. I'm your host, Kerry Zarb, and in this episode, I have a rock star guest for you. Today's guest is the best. Like, honestly, you might not know him, but you will after this episode. Tana Campbell is joining us today. We met on Clubhouse and Tana is the co-host of Real Talk Podcasting, brought to you by Plosive Monster Media and available on all the great podcast channels. Real Talk Podcasting began on Clubhouse with Roman and Pedro and this dynamic trio brings so many people so much value with three daily rooms Monday to Friday. If you're on Clubhouse and you're looking for genuine people to hang out with, this is where you need to go. You can find him on Clubhouse but he also has two great online locations, tannerhelps.com and tannerhelps.club. I really encourage anyone listening, if you're into podcasting, you have to check out these two websites. Tana has been around for over a decade and brings a wealth of knowledge and years of wisdom, and that's why I've brought him on to the show. So welcome to the show, Tana. Hey, Carrie. Thanks a lot for having me. It's uh, neat to have this interaction with you with video. Usually it's on Clubhouse and I can't see your lovely smile or face. Yeah, exactly. It's good to actually see the human, the real human, not just the little piece of artwork that we see on Clubhouse. I agree. Excellent. So thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. And we're going to dive in and and unpack some awesome things. And um, if it's okay with you, Tanner, I actually wanted to start with your story. I wanted to dive into Portland Pod, what that's about and why it started. Oh, that's good. Uh, okay, so I was working in South Florida. I, I was born in Concord, New Hampshire, which is in New England, right next to Maine for international listeners. And my father owned an environmental cleanup agency in the late 80s and early 90s. And during the, uh, I guess it was a recession of a kind that happened in the early 90s, that company went bankrupt and we moved to Florida and I started most of what I remember as being my life. Uh, And we moved when I was in third grade or so, second grade. And I never liked Florida at all. I always wanted to get back to New England. I remembered it fondly. When you're a kid and you don't have to shovel snow, (laughs) you love snow. Uh, And my father, of course, wanted nothing to do with snow because he experienced winter weather as an adult. Uh, And so the first opportunity I got to move back to New England, I took it. There's a lot to unpack there, so I'm not going to do that. Um, But there was a lot in between uh, in between there. I took a trip to Haiti, had some kind of let's not call it a spiritual awakening, but a philosophical awakening in that experience and just a ton of other things that I'm glossing over to get back to Maine. And when I came here, I was working in IT. I was also podcasting and had a couple of studios over those years and a couple of successful podcasts and had been in the space since 2009, technically, uh, and had been working on podcast editing for other people for about five years at that point. But I was still in IT as a full-time job. Uh, Podcasting was still a side hustle. And when I took the job at the United Way, which is why I moved to, or how I was able to move to Maine, uh, it was in an IT capacity. And I had thought at that point in my life that if the IT work, which I hated, could be tied to something more philanthropic, could be tied to something that maybe I could extrapolate more meaning out of a boring IT job. Uh, And it did not. I was totally wrong about that. But now I had moved to Maine and I didn't have any friends. I relocated my dog and my girlfriend uh, to Maine and I couldn't really quit because I had nothing to fall back on. And I was still podcasting. I had some clients uh, who were bringing me in a, a couple thousand extra dollars a month and 
I had never considered that what I could do was open a recording studio. That never even crossed my mind. But when leaving the United the United Way one day, a friend of mine, Ken, who was also a coworker, pointed to an abandoned, not abandoned, but a currently empty ATM space. So this is one of those spaces that you need to use your card to get into. The only thing in it is an ATM, uh, and it's usually in the breezeway of a building. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's dumb. It's all glass. You know, like I, I really dismissed it thinking it was silly. And I'm like, yeah, hey, Ken, thanks for trying to cheer me up, but that, that wouldn't work. And then I got home and I was like, oh, well, I mean, it wouldn't work for producing sound in because it's a terrible environment for that. But if I was going to start a studio, there's probably no better place than in front of one of the biggest buildings in downtown Portland, Maine, where I was now living. <laughs> so for foot traffic, I thought well, it would be pretty great. And so I called the number on the building, which was for the property manager. And I said, hey, <laughs> I'm calling about your empty ATM space. And this is probably going to sound a little weird, but I was wondering if I could talk to the person who, you know, who would actually help determine whether or not I could rent the space. And so he said, OK, yeah, sure. I'll put you in touch with the guy. And the guy he puts me in touch with uh, is a gentleman here in Maine who owns a lot of the commercial real estate in Portland. Really big name. And uh, like I said, owns like what seems like half the city. Mm-hmm. And I say, I've got a crazy idea. And this guy's kind of young. He's, you know, in his, he's in his 40s. He drives like a Tesla, one of the few people in Maine who drive a Tesla. So he's very progressive in that sense. And he says, well, I like crazy ideas. What's the idea? And I said, well, I could put a podcast studio in your ATM space. And he's like, that is a crazy idea. Uh, but it's a crazy idea I like because I'm trying to change some of the outdated Uh, outdated ways of Portland, trying to refresh the city a little bit. And that kind of, maybe that could fit into my vision. I said, okay, cool. He goes, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do. I will give you that space rent free for eight months. uh, But there's a caveat. I have to approve it with the bank and the attorney's offices that are in that building. Because I would be the first thing that people saw when they walked in because of the placement of the ATM space. So long story short, back and forth, it ends up being a no because they're worried that the podcast studio might create content that would tarnish the brand of the bank and the attorneys, which is a totally reasonable concern. Maine wasn't really, podcasts were not really big in Maine uh, in 2017, 18. So it would have, there were a lot of like, how do you listen to them? Are they free? Uh, where do I get them? They were still in that stage at that point. And so that ended up being a no, but I had made the acquaintance of a co working space. And the owner of that co-working space across town in South Portland. And I I had been working there at a desk doing my editing uh, as I was working at the United Way so that I could, you know, stop driving my girlfriend crazy editing podcasts and putting up baffles and stuff in my house. And we lived in a small apartment, so it really wasn't it wasn't a a (laughs) great look. Uh, And so when the no came across, I. I had a plan B, kind of. I had another mm-hmm. space, but I took an offer to uh, the guy who ran the co-working space. And I said, look, I uh, I don't have enough money to rent the studio that, or to rent the office space that I could turn into a studio. But if you give it to me at a half, right, a half price rate, I will allow your members to use it for free. And I'll do all, and I'll do all the build out. The next question, of course, is like, well, if I couldn't rent the space, how could I afford the build out? So those those uh, clients that I had, I reached out to them and I said, you guys have been with me for a few years. You're not paying them. I mean, I didn't tell them they weren't paying that much, but they were not paying that much. Uh, and so I made them an offer essentially that they couldn't refuse. And that was, I will give you a year's worth of service for 50 percent off if you pay the whole year up front. And three of the five of the clients that I had at that time said yes to that. So suddenly I had a few thousand dollars. So Hmm. I start sinking that money into, into decorating, not decorating, but to treating this uh, basically 20 foot by, let's say 20 foot by eight foot rectangular box with one door and two and three windows. It's a terrible space to build a studio. Uh, But I spend that money on equipment, a few Shure SM58 microphones, a board, a computer, and I treated it as well as I could. And in the process of me doing that, there's a local PR company up here run by a woman named Nancy Marshall. And I had never made Nancy Marshall's acquaintance ever. I didn't know who she was, but she had heard about me because 
I was sitting at that desk at one point editing podcasts and doing live streams from uh, Instagram and trying to get attention to what I was doing. Not necessarily because I thought I was going to open a studio, but because I, th I don't know why I did it. I just thought, well, there's not a lot of podcasting action here and maybe I could make myself known as the podcast guy here because seems like nobody's talking about it. And so she had noticed that. And when I posted pictures to Instagram about the progress I was making on, you know, expanding the studio as I put it in the post, <laughs> which is a little, uh, little, little much, but uh, nothing wrong with telling a tall tale or two, I thought at the time. <laughs> uh, so she heard of me and she reached out and she wanted to come in and she wanted to check out the new studio, which currently was uh, in shambles. I mean, when I, f when I got the room, there were sewing machines in it. Uh, there were empty paint buckets. Like it was basically a storage closet that this co-working space was using. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, I have to make this place look pretty presentable because my, potentially my first client is going to show up and want to have a meeting about this. So the, the half of the co-working space that I was doing this in, because the co-working space is split into two halves and the ha at the time, only one half of it had been remodeled for co-working space. The other half was a podiatrist office, <laughs> so so not at all a recording studio. Uh, and so I worked very quickly to rip some boards, stain them, put up an accent wall, build some acoustic uh, material, uh, acoustic panels, bass traps, things like that to try to dress it up. And then I mm -hmm. took some of these old cheap, like the, you know, the waiting room chairs that you see at the doctor's yeah. office. They've got terrible fabric on them, wooden arm chairs. And I brought in four of those and arranged them in like a square and took the mic mounts and mounted them to the arm of those crappy little chairs. And I stood back and I looked at my work and I thought, oh, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> You're listening to the Biz Nation podcast. I would love to connect with you outside of the podcast and you can find me on Clubhouse, Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn by searching my name, Kerry Zab, or directly on my website at kerryzarb.club. And don't forget, if you need more support in your business, you can find the community on Facebook at Biz Nation Support Group. Uh, and so Nancy shows up and she comes in and, you know, like I said, podcasting in Maine was not really a thing at that point. And she was like, well, this is great. And I was like, oh, oh wow. it sure is. <laughs> it's the greatest thing I've ever done. Uh, and she, it ends up being that she, she wants a quote from me. And so I, she, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is like a, this, this is the first client I would have had as like a company. This is a company client. I'm like, oh, I gotta, I can't give her the rate I give my clients right now. Like, is that not enough to make this into a business? So I said, well, I'll, uh, I guess I'll send you a quote. That's what people do when they're in business, right? Uh, so, so we shake hands, she leaves, and I figure out what it's going to cost me to do this. I try to give myself a fair hourly rate for the skill level that I had at the time. And I sent her over a quote and it included some extras and it was just a little more than $9,000 for a year's worth of service. And I thought, I mean, like, what's the worst that could happen? She's going to say no. And, you know, who cares? Uh, but she said yes. So uh, immediately I had like practically $10,000 in the bank and decided, OK, I guess this is going to work, I guess. Like it was as, as surprising to me as it would have been to anybody else, I think. Uh, and it just kind of went gangbusters from there. Nancy is a PR of the podcast she has called the PR Maven. And because of the nature of that podcast, I was able to meet a lot of people uh, who locally in Maine were really, from a relationship standpoint, really beneficial for me to meet and be in front of. And so because mm -hmm. of that one client, not solely because of that one client, but in large part because of that one client in the first year, I met a lot of people and was came across a lot of opportunities that I would not have otherwise came across. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, clients started rolling in and things were super good. Wow. And, but in that, so that first year, we, I started technically doing that in 2018, but I incorporated in February of 2019. And we did almost six figures of gross revenue, we, the Royal We, uh, in that first year. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. I've owned a couple of companies in the past, and I'm like, six figures in the first year is good. Yeah. Uh, 
so I was proud of that. And I thought, okay, well, we've got some profit here. I don't need to pay myself too much. I had some savings. I could just reinvest all of the profit into building out uh, an additional space. So uh, mm -hmm. in addition to the studio that I had built out, I approached the owner of the building and I said, look, uh, I will, I want to expand. And if you are willing to pay for the physical build out of the walls, I'll take care of the acoustic treatment and the special doors and the glass and all that stuff. Uh, but if you're willing to, to pay for the build out of the, you know, splitting this waiting, this podiatrist waiting room into two rooms, an engineering suite and a, and a, a talent booth, I will sign an agreement with you for additional years of, of, uh, of tenancy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I put everything into this second build out. Right. And I think you, you know, what's coming because this is yeah. 2019. Uh, so at the end of the year, I'm like, yeah, we're broke, but, and January is going to suck and February is going to suck, but March baby, that's when it'll come back. March, 2020 is going to be the month that I'll be so glad I made all these investments. And of course it was not. Uh, so oh. really for, for the first quarter of 2020, well, not the first quarter, second quarter of 2020, we had a lot of tough conversations like, are we going to go bankrupt? Probably. Mm -hmm. And there were some, there were some real close calls where I almost threw in the towel because I did not see a way out of that. I'm like, yeah, yeah I just signed this two year lease. I'm spent all the profits from last year. Like, oh man, we're, and at that point, self-employed people couldn't claim anything. And uh, here in the U.S., we had something called PPP, uh, mm -hmm. which was a paycheck protection program. And initially there was an EIDL loan and they were like, we're going to give businesses 10 grand. And then it got changed and they're like, we're going to give businesses a thousand dollars per employee. I'm like, well, I'm the only employee. <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate it, but that's not going to save my ass here. And I really yeah. thought we were, I thought we were doomed. And then in the summer I made the acquaintance of an actor who lives here locally in Maine. Uh, and he turned me on to some film ADR work. I had never done film ADR work before. It was way over my head. Uh, but I was able to partner with some people here in Portland who own another studio and they taught me how to do it. And so then I was able to start taking on that work. And then some audiobook production work came my way and I was able to start taking on that work. And I just kept being willing to really <laughs> say yes, because I was arrogant enough to think I could figure it out. But thank goodness I said yes, because I could figure it out. And that ended up being what saved my bacon uh, in 2020. So 2020 actually ended up being three times better than 2019 because it put me in a position where the people who I had come at that point to rely on for my revenue uh, businesses, creating podcasts and being physically in my space, well, they couldn't be in my space anymore. And so that mm -hmm. forced me to, I would have never even thought to even try to do film ADR. That, I would have never thought about that. I would have never thought audiobooks. I even still in 2020 uh, had a little bit of, imposter syndrome about how good I was, even though I had been editing and engineering audio for dialogue and podcasts for like 10 years, I still was like, yeah, but this is a podcast and that's like the movies and that's like an audio book for a penguin, you know, like that's not, I can't do that. That's professional. I'm an amateur. And so if it hadn't been for the pandemic, which is a weird thing to say, I would have never realized how good I actually was. And I would have never expanded into those spaces. So it's uh yeah it's been an interesting journey what a cool story like you know to to be building this space and i have to ask tana this this whole episode that that happened when you you know you were going into this space and you had to deck it out and you know treat it and, and all that kind of stuff yeah. did you have a couple of months here are we talking a week what what oh yeah no no we did not have a i did not have a couple of months i had uh, i think I want to say I approached the clients on like, let's say arbitrarily, it was a Monday. And then on Thursday, I got the call from Nancy. And then on that next Monday, uh, she was coming in for the meeting. So it was a week's worth a week. of, yeah, like a week. Uh, wow. But I had built bass traps before and acoustic panels before. And like I knew what had to happen to make the space sound good. Uh, and it was just life is full of, you know, you, you walk a path. And we don't really get to say in large part, uh, like what that path looks like. And mm -hmm. I don't think we get to control what walks across the road while we're walking the path or what appears on the side of it. But I do think we get to control 
what we do with those things and how we act when those things happen. Uh, and I just feel like I got lucky 50% and I made some good decisions 50%. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's what it, what it's all about really zigging yeah, when you need yeah. to zig. It's funny that you mentioned the word luck because uh, I, I kind of believe in business that there is an element of that in, in business but at the same time it, you, you're right in what you said as well with the decision making and taking the leap, sometimes having a little bit of faith in yourself and having a go is is what brings it together and what, you know, sends us on our path and our journey and, and can really be quite rewarding which it mm. sounds like that's all happened for you. Fantastic. Yeah, and even taking that client, even taking Nancy on as a client was a risk because what I was doing was promising a year's worth of labor for one payment. Uh, and if it hadn't worked out, you know, it, it would have been very easy to spend $10,000 in gross revenue to run a business uh, in three months. And then I would have mm -hmm. not, if I didn't sign another client, I would have been in big trouble. <laughs> uh, and she might have been able to sue me for not, you know, coming, th following through on a contract. You know, so it was a, those are the kinds of decisions you make as an entrepreneur. And I know you know this, Carrie, where yeah. anybody else would say, I'm not going to take that risk. That is insane. But the, the, yeah. you have to have an, an element of kind of like caution to the wind, I think, at least in my case, to, to be successful as, a, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, definitely. And I think you're right there. It's, it's about calculated risks, you know, mm -hmm. obviously not, not sacrificing uh, everything <laughs> if we can avoid it. But um, if you can see potential, some, but sometimes you've got to take a chance as well. So that, that sometimes comes into play where we have to go with our gut and what, yeah. our, what our tummy tells us to do. And, and it sounds like all of that happened for you very quickly, which, mm. which is fascinating. And, but yeah, as well to add to that, you know, to reach the pandemic, and basically be be slapped on your butt, you know, like you're just down, like who could control that? No one saw it coming. No one knew that that was going to happen and no one had the crystal ball. We still don't have the crystal ball. Things can yeah. change so quickly. Is that what you're seeing as well over there? Yeah. Uh, in fact, much like the ADR work and the audiobook work, something else that I discovered was not just how good I was at what I do, but how much I knew I think that for all, for I mean for all of those 10 years I really took for granted what I knew as not being particularly valuable information but 10 years of experience in your brain about one thing I mean there's a lot you know about that one thing and you come to believe that you know like teaching somebody how to set up an audio interface device and a microphone for the first time like you're like well that's easy that's going to take me 5 minutes nobody cares about that you just figure that out on Google uh, but that's not true. That information is, you know, it took me years to figure out how to, you know, create a good setup, get rid of grounding loops and, and things like that. And that I didn't realize until the pandemic that that kind of stuff had value. I started creating courses in the pandemic and uh, teaching. And I, I went to an elementary school in the pandemic just in the early days of it before I think we knew how serious it was to teach mm -hmm. a class of young people like how to start a podcast. And it was really cool. Um, the, yeah. the last couple of years have been great for me from a professional standpoint. Yeah. Exactly. And I think you raise another good point there is, is the value of what we bring to someone else. Uh, it's often overlooked and, and you know, we, we kind of discount ourselves and, and, you know, maybe not in a monetary sense but certainly in the value sense because we're taking a pain point away from someone else and mm. our expertise and our years of experience comes to the table. So it's not potentially the 10 minutes that we're giving that client. It's all the wealth of knowledge behind that as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, awesome. I wanted to know, Tana, what would be your advice to someone? And of course, you know, we're talking now, not not in the past. But what's your advice to someone that's faced with a business opportunity now? And obviously, take the risk element out of it. But you know, it's still pandemic times, so there's still some uncertainty. Do you have any advice for someone looking to start a business right now? Oh, well. Because I'm crazy, I would say just do it and and don't <laughs> don't worry about the details. That's kind of how I am. But right, th starting a business in the pandemic is different than having a business and needing to help it survive during the pandemic. Um, that's a good one, Carrie. I don't know. I'm throwing you a real curveball. <laughs> yeah, I think be thoughtful about the idea. 
uh, spend some time really doing the research to see if it's something that there's a real need for, you know, doing a SWOT assessment, for example, making sure that there's a need in the market for this idea you have. And don't listen to people who have opinions, but not uh, experience based information. Uh, I have found that pandemic or not, your mom and your dad and your brother and your friends and your sister, they love you. And they don't want to see you fail or suffer. And so generally, the advice that they give you will not be helpful to you uh, taking risks and being successful and taking risks. So just be a little cautious. Make sure that your idea has legs. And don't let those people who care a lot about you talk you out of it. Talk to people who don't care about you. <laughs> just and ask them about your idea. That's great advice. I think, you know, we do need to surround ourselves with others with um, various opinions and we need to take it all in, mm. but we need to filter as well. And exactly what you said, you know, our family and those that are closest to us always have, you know, our best interests at heart, but mm. it may not be the advice that's that's really going to make make or break the situation and, and lead us to the right decision. So I love that advice. It's, it's exactly the zone that I live in as well. And based on your personal experience, and this is pre pandemic mm -hmm. those steps that you took in your business and and the risks and and you know putting yourself out there and really you know stepping it forward quite quickly uh what i, I guess i want to uh, hone into your, your business is very niche or at least it started quite niche it's more broad now how did you and i know this came from years of experience but how did you decide to niche down where did that come from was it a p place of passion or you know things that you enjoyed hmm i don't think i ever while i was doing it realized that i was niching down i don't think i knew that that was a thing i was doing i think that i wanted to escape working for other people uh, like i told you i didn't really like it I am a fiercely independent person. I'm extremely stubborn, much to the chagrin of my significant other, who's probably giggling in the kitchen at that statement. Uh, and I, I can't stand working for other people. And so because I knew I was good enough at audio engineering and podcasting to have, have had clients already, that was kind of a proof of concept to me that I could have more clients and if that were true, then I could technically make some kind of living without having to uh, without having to work for somebody else to get the benefits and such and all those things. Mm. And that was my primary motivator. Like I didn't think, oh, podcasting is not really popular in Maine. So if I were to niche and become the podcast expert, that could be successful. I didn't realize that there was a that there was a space for me to be first to market here. That was all. Mm -hmm. the, those were all things that I realized after I made the decision to start the company because I wanted to get away from working with other people, not with other people, but for other people. I like yeah. people. I just don't like working for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where a lot of us come from. You know, we're, uh, many people have transitioned from the employee life to the self-employed life, and mm -hmm. it's a great step. I highly encourage it for anyone that, that has found something that they want to do and embrace and, and really, you know, take forth and take to market. But um, interesting, you know, that transition time as well and how we everyone evolves differently you know mm -hmm. everyone's in a different financial circumstance that they you know have needs to to meet but um yeah it's it's quite fascinating to me and I love hearing people's stories about how they did transition across and and why why they did it for a lot of people it's because exactly what you said Tana I just you know someone telling me what to do for all these years and you've just about had enough you know perhaps you're in a situation where you've put things forward and it's been ignored or dismissed or not considered of value is is that what you found as well yeah for me i was really good at it uh, and i was at a point in the career where if i wanted to become if i wanted to advance as i guess they say in the corporate world if i wanted to advance my career uh, then i would have to do something like specialize in Cisco equipment or something like I would have to put in a considerable amount of effort to get additional certifications and training. And I'd have to make a very strong commitment because of how much money that would have cost and how much time it would have taken, how hard it would have been. It would have been me making a commitment to IT in a much bigger way than I had up to that point, which was mostly service desks and help desks and things uh, and in the management sphere there. 
And I didn't, I really didn't want to do that. And one of the most frustrating things about working IT for me, once I was at a point where I was, where I knew I was good at it, and is there, when you fix a printer a hundred times, you've only fixed it once or worse, you haven't fixed it at all. And there's that, I don't know if you remember the Seinfeld episode where he talks about how terrible it is to deliver the mail all the time because it never stops. <laughs> uh, and it, it's like that in IT. And, and so I'm a person who, when I see a problem, uh, I don't, n I don't know that I do this intentionally. I think it's just something that I see when I see a problem, I see uh, like a way that that system could be automated, uh, or something could be changed further downstream uh, or upstream mm -hmm. rather that would prevent that problem from happening. And when I would go to people and I would say, when I go to leadership, senior leadership and say, you could solve this problem if we just changed this and this. And when the answer was, but that would cost a lot of money, uh, that would be, <laughs> I would get so viscerally upset about that. And I'm like, but you are costing yourself at least as much money by the problem continuing to exist because you're paying for the labor for people to fix it. Like me, you pay me like $50 an hour to sit here and fix this problem that you could fix for, yeah, it might cost you a hundred grand to fix, but eventually that, that becomes worth it. Cause you're not paying me to do it anymore. You can use me for something else. And there was just a lot of that. Uh, and uh, it really burns me out. I think I, what burned me out about it was less about the repetition of the work. Cause w once you do it enough, you don't see anything new. And when you do, it's like yeah. super exciting, but the longer you do it, the less you see new things it just becomes boring. Uh, so it was, it was a little bit that, but it was mostly, uh, I was capable of doing more in the IT world from the leadership perspective than I was doing from the technician perspective. And it was frustrating that I was never taken seriously from like a leadership position by people who were in leadership positions. And I was very, I was very cranky about that. I didn't like it. And there was a point where I realized that I was getting kind of jaded about it and that it wasn't a good, good feature for my personality. And that was, mm -hmm. that was what got me thinking about doing it for, you know, for, for a nonprofit, for example, like United Way and thinking that that would be different. And then of course it wasn't cause it's the same kind of work and same kind of problems. And it's really just that I need to work for myself because, yeah. you know, if, if I'm the guy who's saying that's too expensive, somehow that's okay. Of course, now being in this position, I think about all the bosses I ever had and I was like, oh, geez, I was an unemployable bastard. I wasn't, I wasn't a good employee at all. Um, but, you know, you live and learn, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it's an interesting, interesting uh, thought process behind that and the way you've explained that because... I'm solution focused. It's not about the band aid. It's not about, you know, let's keep doing it because that's what we do and that's what we've always done and, and that makes this amount of money. It it is about looking for the the overall fix, you know, like what well, this keeps happening. So how can we fix it? And I and I love that. I think that's that's really interesting and and it resonates with me a lot of, of what you just shared. So thank you for that. Mm. Uh Tana, uh next little question for you is What's your advice for someone who is on that treadmill, is the employee oh. and can see that path and that vision and they have a goal, they have a passion, they have something that they're super curious about, you know, what's your advice to them as far as, you know, obviously we can't just, you know, hand in our resignation and, and tell tell our boss to, you know, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. but what, what's your, how do we approach this? What, what's your advice? Well, you can do that. Uh, you can always do that no matter what level of responsibilities you have, like your job and your boss have as much control over you as you permit them to have. That's never not true. That doesn't mean that you quote unquote, can't quit your job because you have a family to feed. Uh, so I understand that, but, but you, you can always walk away and mm. you know it can be varying, varying degrees of difficulty if you do decide to, so for people who don't just want to walk away, um, start looking for something else. You, even if you can't walk away and become your own man or woman, you can always find another job. There's always another job. 
Mm. And, and I've had a lot of jobs, so I know how true that is. Uh, Same. You can always find some place to work. That's not hard. Yeah. And and I would say, if you are thinking about trying to start your own business, talk to some other entrepreneurs who are maybe three, four, or five years in, because they're going to have seen a lot of shit in those last three to five years. Right. That's <laughs> that's a tough time. I'm still in that time for this particular business. There's a lot to learn, and if anybody's going to warn you, right? And then it's entrepreneurs are the business version of like the parents who had kids a month ago and haven't slept in, you know, like <laughs> for six months. So they're going to have all the negative to tell you and they're going to be very upfront and forthright with you. So talk to some people, uh, entrepreneurs in your own life and get their feedback. Uh, and also realize like, Consider in your mind what the worst case scenario really is. Imagine that it happened and then imagine you imagine you had to recover from it. And there's probably a way you could. The worst case scenario is usually not, you know, you're not going to die. Uh, and, you know, the worst case scenario for some people might be, you know, they're living the single life and they leave the job, they start the business, it doesn't work out and they have to get a job at Walmart for a year and a half to get back on their feet. Now, that might sound very unappealing, and I would get that, but that's not the end of the world. You just work at Walmart for a year and a half to get back on your feet. You know, like, it depends on what you're willing to recover from. Um, and like I said, I think something that makes a successful entrepreneur is a comfortability with risk uh, and not being too proud, I think, about what happens if you fail and having to build yourself back up. Yeah, definitely. I love that and I, I agree with you as well because um, failing sometimes makes us better, you know. It's I've, the only I've thing. Had, I've, the only yeah, thing. Yeah, I've had a business failure, like an epic one. It was my first business. It just fell flat on its face and, and that was controlled by me and I take ownership of that. But um, I, it turned me into half the person I am today at the very least. So I don't think it's a bad thing and certainly something that I don't regret. So, yeah, If you don't fail, it means you knew. So, so yeah. failure is just a, it just means you didn't know the answer and now you've learned it and now you can move forward and take the next risk and, and take it in a way that's smarter than you would have taken it otherwise. Failure is great. Yeah. I love failure. When people yeah, fail, I um, just smile and I'm like, yes, that's great. You've just learned a really <laughs> important lesson. Of course, I don't mean that in a terrible way, but I hope no, you know what course. I mean. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Tanner, this has been great. Thank you so much for um, having this discussion with me and, yeah. and sharing your journey and your story and how this all came about. I, I'm super impressed by these these steps that you've taken and where you are today as a result of that. And and I'm also really pleased. I know the pandemic was, you know, and it still is, you know, quite tragic and, and certainly uh, not to, you know, be too excited about it. But I think it's given a lot of people great opportunities and I'm so pleased that you're one of them. Oh, thanks, Carrie. That's that's super sweet of you. I appreciate that. And thank no, you for having me. It's been a good time. No, you're very welcome. I appreciate your time so much. So thank you. And um, we'll chat again really soon. That's right. On Clubhouse. I'll see you there. Thank you for tuning in to the Biz Nation podcast. It was lovely to share this episode with you. Remember to subscribe to catch all future episodes and I would also very much love it if you'd leave me a rating or a review. Until next time, remember that you can also go from headache to heaven in a heartbeat.